Here's an email from a uh, gentleman who uh, does not want his name disclosed. About a year ago in February, I decided to go on a two-night camping trip with three of my friends, John, Joe, and Jim, to a lake called Nutria Number 4, a couple of miles from Rama and Zuni, New Mexico. The lake is well hidden behind the hogbacks and mountains and is great for fishing. We set up camp at a campground located about a half a mile on top of a hill overlooking a small valley. It was a cozy spot behind some pine and cedar trees that acted as a windbreak. At 4.30 after we'd set up the tent, gathered some firewood, and done everything else we needed to do, Joe suggested we go down to the lake and throw some lines. So we packed some light tackle, knowing we wouldn't get back until after dark grabbed our headlamps, and headed out. It was a slow, cold night, but we managed to catch six trout before heading back to camp around 8.30. We were walking along in the dark in temperatures of around 30 degrees Fahrenheit with me in the back when we noticed everything had gone dead silent. We all stopped, switched our headlamps to the highest settings before continuing on, checking every tree, scrutinizing every shadow, and repeatedly scanning the horizon for any predator or anything else that may have caused the quiet. I swung my headlamp around to my right and caught eye shine 30 yards away. They were close to the ground, so my first thought was that it must be just another stray dog that are so common on the reservation. But as I began to turn away, I saw out of the corner of my eye that those eyes began to float upwards. I had a moment of uneasiness, but I didn't want to scare my friends, so I said, hey, let's go a little bit faster. It's cold out. They picked up the pace, and soon we were back at camp. By now, we were freezing and hungry. Our main objective was to build a fire and cook dinner. I thought about what I'd seen, and I decided not to mention it. I wasn't sure what it was, and I didn't want to get my friends worked up over what could be nothing. There was no use in all of us being on the edge. An hour later, we had a decent fire burning in front of us, and our bellies were full of trout, and we were listening to some good music as we sat there talking and having a good time. My concerns over the rising eye shine passed once I was comfortable with the thought that it hadn't followed us back to camp. The sudden, unexpected sound of something that was too big to be just a twig breaking in the trees to our east sent that same fear running back through my body. Someone jumped up and turned off the music and we all grabbed our headlamps. We scanned the area, but the pine trees were too thick to see anything that might be standing in their midst. We listened for another sound, not even daring to breathe, but we heard nothing. Jim picked up a rock and threw it in that direction. It was just our luck that he hit something. It released the most terrifying scream I've ever heard. With our eyes wide and our minds racing, we ran inside the tent and grabbed whatever we could find to defend ourselves. We really didn't have anything that we felt was sufficient enough to ward off something that could roar like whatever that thing in the trees was, but even our pocket knives were better than nothing. Once we were armed, we stood still and we listened. We could hear footsteps coming towards us like huge thundering sledgehammers made by some monstrous beast. The trees started rustling and John began to panic. He was praying and pleading with God to rescue us while the rest of us tried to calm him down. Outside, the footsteps grew louder and heavier as they got closer. Inside, we exchanged silent glances, each of us seeing the fear in the other's eyes and hoping they couldn't see the terror in ours. We caught our collective breath as a shadow stepped between the blazing fire and the wall of our tent, and it stopped. It was enormous and muscular, and it was walking on two legs. We watched in horrified fascination as this thing bent down and seemed to inspect our fish bones and leftovers. Seconds crawled by like hours before it stood erect and it grunted before walking away, apparently taking our food scraps with it. Another 45 minutes would pass in the tent before we were able to talk, much less move around. 
We considered packing up and leaving, but we were afraid to make any noises that might bring the creature back. Nor were we willing to leave the fire unattended, and we weren't about to put it out. Our only option was to wait out the night. It was 10 p.m. now, but our adrenaline was still flowing. I knew we'd need more firewood to make it through the night, so I asked Jim to come with me so we could gather some. Joe and John stayed back to watch over the camp. We headed out, keeping a constant look for any signs of the creature's return as we picked up every piece of dead wood we could find. We reached the top of the hill and looked out over the moonlit valley below. To our utter shock and disbelief, running faster than anything I've ever seen, was a Bigfoot heading towards the other mountain. In what seemed like only a few seconds, it disappeared into the pine trees and it was gone. Jim and I looked at each other, unable to process what we'd just seen. We turned and ran quickly back to the camp to tell John and Joe what we had seen, confirming that it was a Bigfoot that had come into our camp that night. A few minutes later, a long, low howl came from that other mountain to our west. I didn't sleep that night. I doubt the others did either. It was like we'd walked into a nightmare and somehow managed to survive, but my mind could not accept it. When the dawn broke and the sky began to turn a bluish pink, I got up and stirred up the last burning coals of the fire. Then I packed up everything outside the tent and was just finishing when everyone else slowly crawled out of their bedrolls. We cleaned up and finished loading up our gear without anyone saying a single word. Finally, as we were pulling out, everyone spoke at once, asking each other what had happened last night, and no one had a real answer. That was the scariest night of my life. Oh man, well that's awesome. That's an awesome, they actually saw it, a visual encounter. They saw the silhouette through the tent and they saw it running. Uh, I guess there was a moonlight that night so they could see something dark moving, I don't know, through the valley to the other tree. That seems, that would be hard to see, but uh, that's fascinating, fascinating stuff. I guess they could figure it was a Bigfoot because it was moving so fast, you know, because I know there are bears in New Mexico. But anyway, that's a great story. I mean, these guys had like a up-in-your-face kind of a, an encounter. And uh, it's a great story. I really appreciate the writer sending it. Thanks again, buddy. This is an email from Jerry, and here's what Jerry writes. My name is Jerry, and I've always been fascinated with the subject of Bigfoot, ever since I saw The Legend of Boggy Creek in the theater when I was a boy. This story is not mine, but was told to me 12 years ago. I thought it might push the thought button on your other listeners as it did me. The man who told me the story had me absolutely convinced it was true by the way he recalled the event as if he was reliving it. My wife and I started shooting pool in a league playing eight ball. It's the thing we like to do together. The rest of my hobbies are hunting and fishing related, and she doesn't care for those things. I started practicing regularly with a guy named Carl. He was an introvert, but after a while, our friendship grew. We had a lot to talk about with our shared interest in outdoor adventures. As we were playing pool one night, Carl said he wanted to tell me a story, but didn't want me to think less of him for what the story was about. After I assured him I wouldn't judge him, he proceeded to ask me if I believed in Bigfoot or the skunk ape. I told him of my curiosity about the subject, and that seemed to relax him a bit. He told me how he grew up in South Dade County, Florida, and that his parents lived on a few acres that butted right up against the Everglades National Wildlife Refuge. His story took place in the early 1970s, which in those days was serious country living. He explained how he and his friends always played in the swamp, doing what boys do. One day, he ventured back into the refuge on his own, further than he normally would have gone, He had walked by the fire breaks that provided the only decent paths through the thick growth. He thought he had gone a mile or so into the woods. He was taking his time along the way, looking for deer signs and keeping an eye out for snakes. 
He was a long way from home, being 10 years old. He stopped to eat a sandwich that he had brought. He was sitting in the break and had eaten half of it when he heard a noise to his left. He turned to look, and there in the fire break, about 50 feet away, was a creature crouched down watching him. He locked eyes with it, and he sat there frozen in place as it gazed back, teetering its head left and right. It made no aggressive actions in any way. It appeared to simply be observing what he was doing. Carl began to take notice of just how large this thing was. It had broad shoulders and long, muscular arms covered in matted, dark, reddish-brown hair. The face was human-like with a flat nose and wide, thick lips. The facial hair was thin and formed what he said looked like a scraggly beard and a mustache. It was making inquisitive facial gestures that made Carl begin to think, what if this thing charges me? Knowing there was no way to defend himself from such a beast, he thought he had to get up and get out of there as fast as he could. Just as he had thought, the creature stood, as if reading his mind. It was huge, especially to a young boy, at least seven to eight feet tall, he said. This convinced him that he must get out of there now. He jumped up and started sprinting as fast as he could back the way home. He kept running and running, periodically looking back to see if it was following him, but he didn't see it. Relieved that his backyard had now come into view, he looked back once more, and not seeing it, he stopped running and walked the last few hundred yards. Just as he got to his backyard, where the fire break takes a 90-degree turn along the property line, he looked to his right, and there it was. Again, it was only about 50 feet away, crouched in a break just off his backyard, and it was looking at him, twisting and tilting its head. Before, he didn't smell it, but now the wind carried its skunky odor in his direction. He thought it had a satisfied look on its face and realized this thing was just playing with him. His fear left, and he smiled. It seemed to smile back. And they stared at each other for about a minute before it stood up and walked back into the thicket. It disappeared immediately, leaving him wanting to see it more. He figured this thing must have been watching him play in his yard on a regular basis. He'd smelled that skunky odor before on several occasions. Not too long after that, his father moved the family to Central Florida for work reasons. He had gone back into the swamp a few times before they left, hoping to see the creature again, but he never did. I don't know where Carl is these days, but if we ever cross paths again, I would love to hear him tell his story to me one more time. Jerry, what a great story. I really appreciate you taking the time to write that down. This isn't even your story. You're just sharing a story that a childhood friend told you, or a, or not a childhood friend, but he was a pool shooting buddy. And that's really cool. I, I'm trying to remember if I've ever had anybody just that I didn't know really well just kind of start talking about Bigfoot. Uh, probably so, but something always prompts the conversation. And with you guys, I assume it was talking about your outdoor adventures and things like that. But this is great. These secondhand stories are good. We've all heard them. If you guys have heard one and you want to relate it, even if it is, isn't your own story, Feel free to email it to us. We love sharing these things and we love the way you write and we appreciate all the effort you put into writing these emails and sending them to us. I sure appreciate you, Jerry, for the email. Thanks, buddy. This story is from a woman who wants to keep her name undisclosed and here's what she writes. In 1984, when I was 17 years old, my entire family and I drove up to Kern County, California to go off-road camping for a long weekend. We arrived at our destination and found a dirt road that went off the highway into a ravine that was a beautiful shaded area, and it was up against the Kern River. It was surrounded by lots of trees, and there was a nice little creek that broke off from the main river, and it flowed right in front of our camping spot, and then it curved down the ravine the same way the main river was flowing. There were 20 of us in five vehicles. We set up our tents and made lunch. Afterwards, we cleaned up and half the family went whitewater rafting while the other half went to find a local grocery store to replenish our food supply. 
I stayed behind and decided to read a book under the shade of the trees. The wind was blowing just enough to turn all the leaves into a million little fans, making it very comfortable to sit and relax on a hot day. After about an hour, I decided I should bathe while the family was still gone. I gathered up my things and walked about 30 yards down the little creek, about 25 feet down from the highway, to a nice little pool that looked ideal for the job. There were a lot of trees and bushes to conceal me from any passing motorists, and I quickly got in the water and started washing. After a few minutes, I got the worst feeling of dread I have ever felt in my life. The feeling of being watched intently was so powerful, I could barely breathe. I panned the surrounding trees and bushes, but I didn't see anything. I got out of the water and gathered up my things and walked the 30 yards back to the campsite. I dressed inside my tent and then went back out to resume my position in my chair with my book. But now it was hard to concentrate. I couldn't stop of thinking of that earlier feeling of being watched. And because of that, I was now listening to every sound around me. After an hour and a half, everyone returned to camp. We barbecued our dinner and then cleaned up our mess. The adults sat around the campfire drinking beers and wine coolers and telling scary stories. My boyfriend, who was Native American, and I turned in around midnight. At two in the morning, I was awakened by very heavy footfalls coming from the direction of the pool that I had bathed in earlier. I sat up and started to shiver. Whatever this was, it began rummaging around our campsite. I was frozen, barely breathing, and listening intently. After five minutes or so, this extremely large, upright, fur-covered creature walked right by our tent. It was very bright. It was a clear night. The moon and stars were like a million nightlights in the sky. As it walked past our tent, I could see its shape clearly. It was massive. The tent turned completely black under its shadow. Its head and upper body were huge, and I could tell it was covered with hair. Its enormous arms swung with every stride, and its breathing sounded like thunder in an oak barrel. I remained motionless as it walked on by the tent and down the opposite way into the ravine. The next morning, I asked my boyfriend if he had heard or seen anything last night, and of course he said he hadn't. He's very aware of these creatures, but in his culture, you just leave them alone. After breakfast, I decided to walk back down to the pool where I'd bathed the day before. There was an area of bushes about 40 feet further that was matted down. It was not that way the day before. I walked over to it and I could clearly see that something large had been sitting or lying in that area. I remember thinking to myself, wow, I just saw a Bigfoot last night. The next thought was, if it had walked out of the bushes while I was in that pool, I could have been its lunch. We camped there for another two days without any incident, for which I'm grateful. I was able to sleep in peace. I'm 52 years old now, and I live in Los Angeles. There have been a lot of more sightings closer to civilization here, such as in our local mountains and hills. And I'll leave those stories for other people to tell. Thank you for letting me share my story. Well, man, thank you for sharing your story. Golly, how lucky we are to get these emails. And uh, this was written so well. And she, I mean, what an experience. Can you can you imagine feeling more exposed or vulnerable than if you're bathing in a pool in a creek? And then you know something is watching you, especially for a woman. I mean, as a dude, that would make me nervous. I always had this dream. This uh, There's reasons behind some of these dreams, but when I was growing up, I always had this dream that I would wake up in my bed without any clothes on at mid-court in the middle of a football or basketball pep rally, and all everybody in the school would be laughing at me. I don't know why I, don't know why I had that fear. For, uh, I would have that dream over and over. And I felt, uh, can you, I just can't imagine feeling more vulnerable. So I've never experienced it, but I've dreamed it. And that would be unnerving to me. But the, at any rate, this is a great story. And ma'am, thank you for writing it. Hope things are going well in Los Angeles for you. Thank you again. I think that'll wrap this podcast up. Thank you guys for listening and we'll see you on the next one. Thank you. Thank you.